Hello, everybody. Can you, hear, can you hear me okay? I'm going to get on the mic to make sure we get some people from the street, but I want to make sure you all can hear me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joan, for your introduction, and thank you so much to the Writers Guild of Bloomington for having me here. Um, as Joan said, I'm an Indianapolis-based poet. Thank you. Thank you so much. How are we doing now? Yay. Better? Oh. Oh, and the balance is just delicious. I love this. So um, I'm so happy that you all are here because I, as a poet, love small crowds and intimate crowds. But I also like crowds that can get a little bit wild, too. So I should let you know that I come from actually a spoken word background. I started writing poetry when I was little, a lot like the writers you'll find in Bloomington Writers Guild. Um, but then when I was going through rough stuff in my own personal life, whether it was my home life, whether it was the military, whether it was life after the military, writing was a constant out uh, for me to process and get those feelings. So I joined the military back in 2010, just after Don't Ask, Don't, or just before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. Um, I am a non-binary author myself. I use they, them pronouns. And then also served as a drill sergeant during the Trump administration era switchover. It was a very interesting time. So some of the poems that I have for you today are, hopefully will give you a little bit of insight into military life, maybe some stories that we don't commonly hear day to day. But I would actually like to start you with a poem that pulled me from the military into spoken word poetry outside of my military life. And it's called Walls. I'm on the phone with my mother for my normally bi normal bi-monthly check-in. Since last we spoke, life has completely upended, grabbed me by the ankles, and shaken the willpower loose from my pockets. Hopes rattle and roll down the sidewalk for all the watchful world to judge, and for now, she is the human embodiment of unsolicited advice. What you need to do is this. What you have to do is this. No, 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 not that way, don't. And I tell her to slow her roll. I'm going my own pace. She says her recommendations are good ones, and talking to me is, admittedly, like talking to a wall. But in my room, my walls are white and plain and tall, not because I am white or plain or tall, but because the base paint is a top coat of potential I've never committed to changing. My walls are blank, slightly scuffed, only by Bob Ross brushes, happy little mistakes of some construction crew. If anyone else came into my room, it would be whatever they made it. My walls do not call me names using words I've never heard. My walls do not try to make sense of things for me, twist definitions to fit their expectations, lean ladders to the pinnacle of someone else's potentials. My walls do not judge if I go to church or how I worship. My walls do not judge if I wear a wedding ring for a fee, male, or a transitioning partner. My walls do not judge if I grew up on the wrong side of tracks or in luxury's lap. My walls do not care how pristinely the poker chips are stacked against those who have more life or light or reason. Those who felt opportunity, pressure cooking, privileged experiences because my bedroom walls, they don't close in. Even when the open air is claustrophobic, they hold their space. My walls do not erase my experiences. They listen when I come to them. The quietest room in the entire world is negative 9.4 decibels in Minnesota. Of course it's in Minnesota. It absorbs all of the noise from outside and blocks out the inside. It's so quiet, you can hear your heart beating, your man heart, your woman heart, your gender queer heart, your heart of every color, your pagan or Abrahamic heart. It's so quiet, you can hear your lungs filling with the same air that existed everywhere else in the world at some point in time. But if you stay in that room too long, they tell you you might go crazy. So my walls have a door for whenever I'm ready. When the space has been held, I hold head high as I leave in the direction of conviction and intention. My mom, she says her recommendations are the good ones. And talking to me is like talking to a wall. I only hope that I can be a wall. Standing firm, listening, protecting, holding space. Thank you.
so that poem doesn't have anything to do with the army, which is probably why I loved writing it. Um, <laughs> the poem itself, the army was the best job that I've had in the worst ways possible. Um, just because all of us have to come together as military service people from all different walks and, walks and all different communities. Walls actually came to be because it was from an equal opportunity course that the Army was offering for its leadership so that way we could have better community within the Army. So that we didn't just throw a whole bunch of people to get trauma bonded together, to fight a war or battle together. People actually came with respect and the culture of the army was shifting much more into human care and human understanding than just simply limiting it to the war. So the poems that I have are a lot on these soldier issues. And one of these poems that I wrote, Walls, specifically racked up, I think it was like 10,000 views or something in the first two weeks, and it was able to be shared throughout. So when I talk with poets and communities, especially about military, but in general, it's not just about your poem being on the mic or in the stage or with the audience. It really is where it extends further, so I appreciate you listening to that. So... Since I am going with the military theme here, I wanted to read a poem that actually um, came from my time as a drill sergeant. And as I said before, I served between 2015 and 18 as a drill sergeant. Those were my years. And there are always things that are important to call for in the care of our troops. One of those things, of course, is suicide intervention and prevention. Um, depression, substance abuse. So part of what I did during my senior capstone project at IU Indianapolis was to get poetry for advocacy. If you're interested in any of these poems which take military issues, give a blurb of context specifically from reports of the military on these topics and then have a poem in reaction. Um, these are specifically meant to be discussion for groups to take back home. So this one is called Bookmarks. I'm sorry, I can't do this without getting in character. Do you guys mind helping me? Like, it's gonna get a little loud though. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> I always wanna warn people. In the early morning rain, with my weapon in my hand, I'm coming home today, from this hard board to my rag. Oh, that you would not be mad with me from day to day. I become a different person than I was when I went away. My friends stopped giving me bookmarks as gifts. My bookshelf is stacked three deep with dozens of well-intended starts and few follow-throughs or finishes. I let my life interrupt someone else's narrative, stick bookmarks in them, tassels draped along spied straight at attention, waiting for a graduation switchover that never comes. Just stays. Private Santa Bria stayed right as he wrote in the end of my cycle yearbook, lucky to have you as my drill sergeant. You're a big inspiration. Up until that spot, narrative plot culminated in the snapshot at the end of the protagonist's life in which he and 170 trainees learned how to shoot, fight, and save lives. Like every cycle, I was proud I'd have even a small part in teaching them to stand straight at attention, left face, right face, forward march, into the future. Bookmark. World War II, common books communicated uncommon code spies, referenced words and previously agreed upon passages to say, need help now. Attack is coming at darkest hour. Foretelling nearly imperceptible events right under public noses. Spies couldn't bookmark. There was only a small window of time codes could be cracked and still apply. Private Santa Bria messaged me last year asking if I remembered him. I did. And since I loved making marksmen out of those who'd never held a weapon, he knew that I was going to be as excited as he that he got his conceal and carry. Bookmark. A grimoire is a book imbued with the essence of who the author was, trying to make sense of his life, of his unique magic, what he hoped to overcome, what he hoped to become. 
Private Santa Bria, if I could tell you anything, it's that soldiers don't shoot for re least restrictive means. We shoot to eliminate the threat. But you didn't listen when I said friendly fire is a no-go here. Your carefully crafted crucible shouldn't have been bookmarked, shouldn't have been abandoned, shouldn't have been disregarded for others as too much to take in. But you can't put a bookmark in hope forever. What happens when there's a book you've sworn you had the strength to come back to, and you forget where you were in the story, forget how you got there? I wish I taught him how to fight, how not to fire his weapon, how to stake steady position, aiming, breathing, action, and gaving between his trigger finger and his skull. Bookmark. Bibliomancy is the ancient practice of cracking codes to the future, letting the book fall open to a random passage and with eyes closed, picking out destiny. I couldn't bookmark his answers, but they were on every single switch books here because this was in that book. Luckily it's waterproof. I, I kid you not, uh, the first venue that I had was out in the middle of the woods. Poets took speakers, microphones, we ran extension cables because poets will make anything happen if they want to show. And we ran it into the woods in the middle of the night, had a bonfire, and hoped to God we wouldn't choke or get hit by lightning. And that was spoken wood. So I specifically made this with a waterproof cover for that venue because poets also look ahead a little bit every once in a while. But that project was kind of as I was coming into poetry, I hadn't really found community. I really hadn't found, I found a couple of other poets to connect with. But Fourth Street Festival, Writers Guild of Bloomington, and then Bloomington Poetry Slam really is what brought me here to Indiana. Um, but I'm an army brat. Am I from anywhere? Closest is here when I moved here in 2019. And so this is a poem actually about driving to training, and it's presented as a pastoral. <laughs> New Mexico Diner. There is a long stretch in New Mexico southbound where nothing exists. No radio stations, cell phone signal, divorce papers, gas stations. If you happen to stop there in a small diner before the long stretch, the one the size and shape of a microwave oven, they might be polite enough to tell you, to fill up now. The last guy, he got stranded out there. It was for hours, days. Maybe he never left. And I wonder if he just kept going south, or if the sun stripped his shadow from his bones as he withered at the foot of the cacti that said, you're ours now. Were we ever solely self-possessing? Or shared in facets, like that glisten of condensation from the lemonade the waitress poured for me, cloudy with haze in that microwave oven, some sort of oasis in this heat, sugar. She says, and I don't know if she's asking me or offering me. All I know is as I drive, nothing else exists for three hours, and nothing can take the ground beneath my feet. Not even the sun, not even the moon, or these stars, or stacks of paper with my old last name. Thank you. So another theme that I write about in, I've got, uh, how are we on time, Joan? I'm sorry, normally I bring, beautiful, excellent, yes. Poets think of everything. <laughs> beautiful, candy. So part of my journey through the military, I got out of the military in 2009, uh, 19 on disability, I had, during my time in drill sergeant, I was running, and all of a sudden I felt my hip grinding, like those, those brakes on your car. And it would be fine for downhill a little bit, and then it would we'd go uphill, and it would grind and grind and grind, which is great unless you're doing a re relay and carrying the American flag, and that's not a good time for that to do that, because then you get referred to the hospital. It turns out that this was really good, because this was a follow-up to a misdiagnosis that had been happening since 2010, and it was a bad hip surgery that got me out. I went from 18 hours a day of rucking and running and marching and yelling, and you're not the only, like, the soldiers aren't the only ones doing it. If you're a drill sergeant, you're running after them too. 
And so I couldn't do that. I went from 18 hours to nothing. And I'm a mover and a shaker, typically. So part of what I talk about is the journey of disability because since then, not only have I, sometimes uh, my poets and friends, they see me with my arm brace, today's a good day, nerves are doing great, we're rocking it. Um, but other times, like I still have my hearing aids, I still have PTSD, I still have anxiety, which is why I like little groups instead of big wild groups, typically. We can get there, we can get wild, man, we can. <laughs> But when I write about the medical aspects, it's a common point in the military story to tran transfer out of the military and then try to navigate the disability settings. And so this is a poem based on that. I'll try not to leave a scar, she says, pulsing the lump where my neck and my shoulder meet. I feel them word and digit digging in unfamiliar touch but expert at what lies underneath the skin. There's a numbness beyond pin and needle. It's present in the absent spaces, the ones that learn to fill themselves. Isn't that the way of it? How our encounters never leave us fully unscathed. That we scalpel the gristle we have come to know for ourselves. What a flinching picture of life without it. And as if to hear me, and as if to hear that thought, she says, I'm sorry, does this hurt? And she presses latex thumbs together, whispering to encourage a release. The lab results will be back by the new year. We can go from there. As if I am supposed to wait, heal, and not find a scar on a body full of them. Lips, throat, knees, nose, vastus medialis, tensor fasciae, laetae, shin. My medical file thickens. I was done before I knew it. We don't yet know which attachments still linger, but for now, there is surprisingly little blood. Thank you. So poetry also gives us some really amazing opportunities to find community. I, I've done a little bit of the military and stuff, but I would be remiss to say that when I do military poetry, it's only military poetry. Um, because whoever serves, serves in the full capacity of whoever they are. So for me, I brought my poetry and art, and honestly, I kind of hit it. Because I'm like, who in the army wants to hear poetry? Who in the army even writes poetry? Who in the army would travel for poetry? The person who travels for poetry is the person who doesn't want to go to end of day formation because there's a poetry show in North Carolina at that post, by the way. Uh, definitely, definitely almost got caught by curfew a couple of times. But that's, that for me was the major show, that poetry was really the calling the army was a means to an end. And the army is a way that we can talk about different issues. Um, I'm going to do one last army poem. And this actually kind of crosses over into my space afterwards. Because as a veteran, sorry, I have to be really careful about how I navigate this because I don't want to speak for all veterans, right? That's one of the important things with poetry in the mic. I'm speaking for my experiences just to give an additional insight. And I actually wanted to do, I'm going to do two more in the time that I have. One is about um, the substance abuse issues that we were talking about beforehand that a lot of soldiers go to because it's coping in a really high stress environment. And then the next one actually is DC Alcoda, um, published in IU Indianapolis's Genesis Literary Magazine. Um, and these poems specifically were on veterans issues. Uh, DC Alcoda was a poem about 2021. We'll get to it in a second. Tarantella. The bartender swings the bottle over two glasses set on the altar of a Friday night. Don't worry, you'll need this. This week has bitten you. Poison in, poison out, my love, drink up. The communion rolls down my throat to a choke point. I brace for better against polish wood. Ask for another. Sweet lemon shot turning my mouth. Shove a ten in the tip dar to a turned back. Sway my way to a crust, vel crusted velvet couch that's probably cradled too many lovers. 
Put seasick glasses on the low table. We punch this week in the face to your health, one for your soul. I slam one glass, hold my second. Sweet lemon shots turn my mouth again, and I pass liquor through the loose-lipped kiss to someone who hasn't legally seen God. We don't dance, we pulse. We freeform flow into hours when only the divine would be awake, strobing. Our shadows play on a gridded confessional wall. Stained glass chandeliers paint us holy. Black grit and decay fills our lungs, the spirit reminding us of our dusty return. Driving bass, driving bass smothers creaking floorboards, still saturated with Tampa tobacco, hand rolled through the years, into the gulf, salt and sweat, sour carpets, stained shame of a thousand weekend escapes. And we pulse. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Have mercy on us. Thank you. So this poem, um, I wanted to talk a little about a little bit more coming up to it, was DC Alcoda, and again, written, uh, Genesis Literary Magazine is available for free at IU Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, but I have to, originally y'all almost had me here at Bloomington, I gotta, I gotta say, I almost came down here for the MFA program. It's still possible, I might still do it. Um, but DC Alcoda, a lot of my friends were turning to me as a veteran and asking how the reactions to the January 6th attack on the Capitol was. And I will speak honestly and say it was one of the hardest days of my life to watch. Um, and I, I worked with drones, and this was hard, as hard, if not harder to watch. And so this is the poem that I wrote in response to that. And please, these are just from my experiences. This isn't for everybody in the military, but just to give an additional perspective. This poem itself bounces between my time as a drill sergeant back in 2015 and then 2021. One, drill sergeant, can you burn my flag? I wave away his smirk and I motion, give it here. The private prized the Velcro flag on his uniform, fuzzy from wear and it's fuzzier than his rank. Embroidery tension frayed from everyday tear. The spark start of a lighter, a flame, a flashpoint. This is one thing among us, I say, but be careful who's watching. We wouldn't want them to get the wrong idea. It's one thing to burn the edges of this patch, make it good as new, acceptable for wear. It's another to burn it out of freedom. This is your flag too. Care for it as you need to. The questioning refrain, but what about in protest? Covered under free speech. All of it. The right to burn a flag, to kneel with it, to fly it upside down in distress. If a protester feels there's need for it, this cloth is voice and presence and power. If not for all, then for whom? Two. It's 12.49 p.m. afternoon. My heart is pounding the drum roll of another, another civil war in my throat in hours of and seconds, in prayer, in refrain, beating like, a ba beating like a flagpole on the Capitol steps, and there is no place for this type of wrong, the spark of a flashpoint, a flame, a warning. This is one thing among us, but be careful who is watching. Some dead, fla some dead flag parades in the halls as a living victor, and I wonder if the hands of Cleo's clock have stopped, if she watched from the hallways of the house, wondered if her gay was in, a gaze was in glee or horror, if it was some rebirth of a nation again. How many has she midwived? One, private. Are you asking me about protests because in August, a black football player kneeled, kneeled as in protest, kneeled as in prayer, kneeled as in reverence, kneeled as in acknowledgement, instead of burning a flag or putting his hand over his heart, instead of complying to violence? Some considered this the greatest offense, disrespect to our flag, never like recoloring it black and blue as in brutality, black and blue as in bruising, from the finger pre deep press to find the pulse of the black cadaver. Three. This cloth is voice and presence and power. If not for all, then for whom? Give a name to the distress. Signal however you can. Make your grief unmistakable, your questions unavoidable. The sacrifice of symbols is a sacred voice. People will always judge you for it. Seek ways to invalidate you for it. You, your life, your heart beating in refrain. This is your flag too. 
care for it as you need to. Burn, make new, acceptable. You have the right if there's a need for it. Two, I emailed the architect of the Capitol to ask if any clocks were broken during the riots. None of the historic clocks were damaged on January 6th, as if time kept going with or without a whole nation behind it. DC Alcoda, the thread from his flag shrinks from the heat, coiling tightly, blackening into crumbling, rubbing into good as new, into January 7th, into some refrain of a spotless nation, put back where it's supposed to be. No one ever the wiser. Thank you. I love it when a plan comes together. So after my time in the military using poetry to advocate for people, one of the other things that uh, myself, my husband, our community and friends do, is actually use poetry, hopefully you can see, as a means of activism within our community. So other poems have included Safety Brief, uh, which is another poetry um, about protesters and vehicle strikes that were happening in Bloomington and police brutality in Indianapolis. And so I would encourage any of the artists, any of the authors today, it's not just about having the words on the paper, it's about what you do with them. And I'd really encourage you, whatever you choose to do with them, it's the right thing to do, and you can always do more. So I'd like to offer this with my last poem. Um, I mentioned this specifically because, again, it's another perspective as a military veteran and as a uh, student and as a protester and a number of things. Um, I, I try to beat the street as much as possible because I don't think that change only happened when I was a teenager. Change is happening every single day. Um, and I was very lucky when I was 16, 17 to be given that chance for people who were much older than myself. And we got to pass it forward. Um, this is a poem specifically regarding Aaron Bushnell, uh, who is the veteran who self-immolated self against uh, the, war, the war in Israel and Gaza um, back this past fall. Or, sorry. Um, and it's hard as a veteran because on the one hand, you don't want to glorify extreme acts of protest. And you also want to talk about it. The one thing that bothered me was that nobody in the news, nobody in the media was talking about the fact that a veteran was so distressed by the state of our current, current wars that they felt the need to take ultimate protest action. Um, and that, that bothered me. And so I wrote just this very short poem uh, as we prepare for our next poet. And it's called Exporting Flowers. And it takes imagery from my time as a drone, uh, a drone analyst, um, time as military intelligence, and a couple of other things in order to really push this through together. Exporting flowers. Regarding airmen, Aaron Bushnell, part one. The bloom at your feet and our doorstep spreads poppy field. Unfolds rash and back blast braiding flesh with hush mingled skin snap, rolling into fighter jeans scream and jet rush, blossom carpet bomb, scorching each earthen thread. The flush prickle and sweep low crawls along the tender limbs. Among smoke song of crackle lipped choir, voiceless and still begging, how much more charcoal do you need? Is my body not enough to satisfy the fire? Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate you. Please come see us over at the Writers Guild in Bloomington. We'd be happy to type up the poem for you. Thank you so much and have a great day.